Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I know it's just post lunch and people's tummies are full. But, uh, you know, we promise to have this engaging conversation with you all and the panelists. And hopefully we'll be able to take some valuable nuggets back home. Uh, you know, so the topic for today is leveraging customer data and personalization strategies for purpose-driven marketing, right? Uh, we are living in a very evolving world where everything is super rapid. Consumers are becoming super demanding. Their expectations have increased. So, you know, it's become very important for businesses to sort of leverage data in a very meaningful way, right? And uh, data ha is a word that is thrown, um, you know, quite a bit around. But what does it really mean to actually unify this data, right? Collect this data and do something impactful with it, right? So just to start with, you know, I wanted to actually throw like an open question to the panel. Maybe we could start with you, Dipinder. Just wanted to understand, uh, you know, how are you leveraging customer data for purpose-driven marketing? And what are the strategies that you can give us some real-time experiences to leverage this data and use this data effectively? So, uh, uh, so very, it's, it's very important uh, for us to understand that, you know, personalization is super critical in a business, right? Specifically, a business which spans over 40 cities and over 50 specialties. So a person reaching out to me for a specialty A cannot land on specialty B. My communication cannot be incorrect. So my data starts from the point when a person, so being a very data for uh, a digital first company, so we are able to track what the person is searching from. From the point of starting our data journey starts there, that from there, where is he going? What is he doing on a website? And what all actions has he taken? And uh, every time that, you know, uh, there are data interpretations that need to be taken out that, you know, what is a person looking for and what are you showing him? And is that even useful for that person? So if, let's say, I am looking for a hospital and you are going to talk about that, you know, we have, uh, uh, this is the cost of a surgery or a treatment that is there, a person will not be in will not be interested in it. You have that data point with it. You got to use that. You got to use that in a way that benefits your customer and your business. It cannot be that, you know, uh, that I will only do this for the customer. I'll give him way too much information and not do the business. It's, it's that you have to leverage that data in a right manner so that you are able to guide him throughout that journey because the journeys are complex and there are multiple touch points specifically in our business. There are uh, there is a touch point where a person gets in touch with the coordinator from our end. There's a touch point where he gets in touch with our doctors. There is a touch point where he is uh, entering into a partner hospital. So at every point, we have that data available with them that, you know, what is the communication? How do we leverage that? What are the issues that are being faced by the customers and how are we solving them? So it's not only just the part of the how to begin the journey, but also how we're making the journey more and more comfortable around it. Right, absolutely. I think uh, very good points there. You know, we as marketeers are the first touch point when it comes to data in a company, right? So we, I guess we have to take this to sort of drive the business on, right? Coming to you, uh, Esha, you know, you have seen uh, this industry very closely and you have a lot of sort of clients, um, you know, who leverage different kinds of data. data. So what are the trends that you are seeing, uh, you know, in this ecosystem today. Uh, thanks, Anisha, for the opening question. And I'm um, very happy to be part of this amazing panel uh, discussing a topic which is very close to a researcher's heart. Uh, so at NEPA, we are, of course, a research firm, a consumer science firm. So this uh, topic, as much as what well, the theme is as much of an opportunity uh, in the ecosystem, is also a confusing uh, place to be in, uh, specifically being a data firm. Uh, because the words purpose and personalization have uh, brought in reverse trends uh, in research. To quote some examples, uh, we are seeing that uh, personalization, uh, the rule of personalization says that treat people not like data number, but like, like a human identity. Now it's easier said, but then done. Uh, we are seeing that uh, as much as quantitative data, a lot of uh, big segmentation and a lot of quantitative work uh, that has been the pulse of research industry. Uh, I have been seeing a comeback for a lot of exploratory and qualitative understanding a whole lot more. 
which is understanding humans, understanding and being part of those group conversations, being very close uh, to the pulse of the consumer because data is honestly now everywhere and there are multiple sources. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'm also seeing, at least from an agency point of view, is that the collaboration between the clients and agencies is like much stronger because it's about going beyond data. It's about looking at gut plus combined with data and seeing that, okay, a particular, uh, you know, quote unquote, a number could be a 57% of people did so and so. But what beyond? What is uh, the psyche? What does neuroscience say? What are the other facets of data and methodology is really tying up? So I think personalization and purpose has brought all of that upfront in consumer science and research as an industry. Okay, thanks so much for that, Isha. You know, Ishvandar, over to you. You're in a very, very interesting industry. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody sitting here is quite interested in the industry that you are a part of. So when it comes to you and your industry, how are you leveraging the data, right? I'm sure there are certain, uh, you know, aspects to the data that may be, um, you know, that, that may have like sort of a thin line, but how are you leveraging this data? It'd be good to know. So, uh so what I will do is I will take away from exactly where Isha started. It's a very, very important piece. Uh, look, we do have certain data points which are vectored, so we don't look at that data. But if you agree, is this better? Oh, great. Thanks a lot. Um, I think it's important to call out that certain parts of data points are regulated in industry, but I think what's important is the conversation which Isha was talking about, and I'll talk about it as a marketeer. Uh, there's a very important fundamental piece here, which is that there is a lot of data which is out there, okay? Uh, if you're creating, uh, and there's tons of raw data, if not rightly looked at, if right, not rightly segmented, and if the right insights are not derived, it will lead to a stage where you look at the scale of data and you, it could paralyze you. And we've seen that happen in a lot of projects, okay? Where you have so much data and you say, okay, for how do I make sense out of this? But the nuances in the data, which start telling you, okay, this is a potential area, which comes out of qualitative, uh, quantitative, and then when you put a qualitative lens around it, okay, and go deeper into finding the insight is where the magic happens. Uh, and that's where the difference really comes, okay? Because frankly, it's not just I who have that data today. The systems, the processes, the tools across organizations would be pretty similar. We all have access to, okay, all of it. We all would have prime tracks. We all would have very similar tools out there. But how do you find that consumer insight which gives you a unique differentiated space is what you need to move ahead of data. So data married with human intuition is where the differentiation comes for successful companies. If you just look at data in isolation, I mean, I was, I was just joking with Dipinder a little bit before that. If I say it's 30 degrees, is it good or it's bad? You don't know. But if it's 30 degrees to somebody who's in Rajasthan versus if I say it's 30 degrees to somebody who's in London, the reactions would be very different. So setting that context and putting that qualitative lens is extremely important. You know, Ishinder, that's a very interesting point that you made there. And I'd definitely like to touch upon, you know, where do you find the right balance between human intuition and data, right? Because with great data comes great responsibility also. So I'd really love to touch upon that. But before that, jo Joydeep, you know, over to you. I'd love to know how you leverage data at ADA52. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Um, Actually, I would agree with a lot of points raised here by Isha and Ishwinder. Um, the data plays a very, very important role, but till the time you apply the layer of qualitative uh, insights on it, there's precious little you can do with data. Um, and, and I actually have the privilege of coming from organizations where you have really a lot of data which comes in uh, very quickly and you can act on it, right? Now, how does data help you? Uh, data helps you with making 
कम्युनिकेशन टू कंज्यूमर एक्सट्रीमली कंटेक्चुअल एंड इमीडिएट राइट बिकॉज यू नो विद काइंड ऑफ सिस्टम वी हैव आई एम एबल टू टॉक टू अ कस्टमर अबाउट समथिंग विच the customer is probably involved in right now for example you know a, a player is playing a hand on our system right and uh, we know you know the distribution of different kind of players on the table and 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 maybe this player is a new one and and he plays a hand which is very very off right now we as an organization uh, consider it as our responsibility to make sure that every player has a certain kind of experience on our platform right so then it becomes our prerogative to also prompt this customer and this this player and tell them you know this is where you could have played differently and this is where probably you could have had a different experience or outcome from this game right so data becomes very important when we are talking of immediate contextual communication or a response to a consumer it becomes very very key having said that there are higher order things which come out only from qualitative insights that you pick up from consumers when you talk to them right so marrying both these things together is where magic happens and data stand alone could probably not uh, you know absolutely calculate. some great points there uh, thank you joydeep for that uh, you know madhur coming to you i think with lenskart you know there is definitely like an omni channel play right when we talk about data in your context there's a lot of offline data and online data uh, that is available to lenskart to play with right so from that that context how are you leveraging it uh, at lenskart so thank you for the question uh, so uh, uh, see you have you have spoken about the word omni when it's omni there's no difference of using offline data to specific to offline or online to a specific online um uh, i will very much align to what yashwinder sir have said that you have lot of data coming out from all the channels you have been working from a sales standpoint and from the marketing standpoint if you don't know what to do about it it's going to be wastage and uh, we as a marketer we just don't talk about the analytical part of collecting data i think we all will agree to the in the board rooms the problem we have to face is the limitation of budgets we have and how do we going to use it so data to we have like everywhere we have data like you know basically social media is providing you a lot of engagement data uh, in that also there are a lot of breakups your marketplaces are providing you different sort of channels in lenskart we have another service called hto where we go to the customer home and get a lot of information and collect that and it's a it's a free eye checkup so you can call and we collect the data now what i supposed to do with it we have to understand what is the cohorts we are targeting how much and what is the right time to do that and how much roas which is the final ultimatum of it i'm getting out of it maybe i have a i have a very aligned and very planned strategy on social but the money i'm going to invest in that same money can be invested in performance and i'll get better roas so the communication play here a very important role so i am a fan of communication and content because i get data very easily uh uh i'm i'm being leading into the market with let's say amazon pi provides me everything and anything i can ask for but then how to utilize it in the same universe of amazon because it's very different you first pay them about uh having been listed on the commission basis then you have to fight with the competitive brands to get overbid and i'm i'm sure many of us have been facing this so using the right techniques to understand evaluate that data and right and you know target them with the right messaging at right time so that you don't burn a lot and churn out the data to and the cycle of data as well the top middle bottom uh, funnel data size if you know that what is the uh, you know uh, is it like overlapping that understanding also needs to be done so we in lenskart has a team of about 30 40 people in just analytics and uh, our our uh, you know uh, management is very much into tech and data driven strategies so we keep getting reports every day what's happening in what channel our job is to create a correlation that where the brand is getting most benefited and that's how we create our platform it's amazing mother thank you so much for that uh you know at the end of the day a consumer business is all about human connection right it's all about because we are we're people selling to people at the end of the day right so i just wanted to understand from each one of you how do we strike a right balance between human intuition like ishwinder you just uh, rightly mentioned and the data insights that we have right what is it what is the sweet spot to actually have these two uh, you know sort of be channelized together maybe uh, you know madhur i can start with you on this so 
uh, what is exactly the context of I mean, what what you uh, looking at in this question? I mean, so so for example, like in um, in this case, right? When we talk about uh, human insights, I'm sure like there's a lot of data that you get where people have gone through your carousal and they've like uh, added a few to their cart, right? But at the end of the day, how do you know what is the good behavior to sort of uh, reach out to them on that? So. See, we are into the fashion business. We have a mandate to come out with something new because we as a human get bored of something very easily. Yeah. We have to keep creating that FOMO that you're missing out on something. Uh, in Lenskart, uh, we have a, a master collection coming out every month and then there are certain small collections come out every week. So you can imagine in a year how many new ranges of eyewear itself is coming out so that we can be trendy at the same time. And I think in the uh, the room we were sitting, someone was talking about the different layers of Gen Z and, uh, you know, different set of audience coming. They all have a different taste. I mean, I'm just going to talk about from our side how we think uh, and what strategies are pretty much working. Is that it's as simple as that. My intent is that you have multiple uh, pairs of shoes, shirts, and a lot of other things. Why just have one eyewear? So as a marketing uh, uh, team uh, person in, in Lenskart, we think that it has to come out as a strong fashion-led brand. Um, you should be aware about the education, that what goes well with what, and that's how we aim that you should have different pairs for your different needs because that's how the lenses works. And we create certain things around it. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, obviously, another element to it is um, the balance which you have asked for. Uh, churning out that data, making those cohorts, but creating a right messaging, which I've again said, is something where human can the do best job because they personalize it. India is a beautiful place to have a lot of, uh, you know, festivals around. There's a lot of events keep happening around. People get inspired and as, uh, as, uh, had a lot of aspiration to, to see something and have something. So how quickly we collect that data when there's something new to has come up. There's one data, data element which works around your existing audience. But there are some time when you're creating something, there's no market for it, but you're confident that this is a need, which we have but just one data we had, which is searches. We saw people are looking for it. And if we can be on the top of it and bring it to that, in that case, there's no data to defend you. There's no data to benchmark. The only go thing you can go with is your, your intuition, your creativity. You have to tell your consumer that, hey, you're here and you're using this, but this is not the right approach. You have to use this. So I think that's yeah, answered. great, uh, great points from you, Madhur. Joydeep, over to you. You know, a similar question: How do you strike a right balance between uh, human intuition and the data points that you collect? Yeah. So I would like to share an anecdote uh, from my previous organization to really illustrate this and make it very clear about you know how to strike this balance. Uh, and and uh, the anecdote I would share is from Etl. Uh, in Etl, I was leading a business called International Roaming Business. Now, data was telling us, and like I said, we get data very, very real time, right? So we can act and then really do a lot of marketing based on that. Now, data was telling us that every month, there are about 3.5 lakh people from India who travel to UK but never really buy any kind of international roaming packs, right? And for the longest time, we kept sending them a lot of communications around, you know, this is how our packs are very great. This is why you should buy our packs, right? And the conjecture was that, you know, people are usually habituated to, you know, sticking to their purchasing behavior. And maybe at some point in the past, they have, you know, bought an international roaming pack with somebody else. And they're just sticking to that habit. And maybe that's why they're not buying. We couldn't solve this for a very long time. We kept communicating on discounts. We kept communicating very quickly. We kept communicating about more data for you. Why don't you take this? You know, why don't you make your trip worthwhile? Why would you keep waiting for Wi-Fi wherever you go, right? Why don't you carry all your data with you so that you're independent? Because we used to get this insight that a lot of people actually look for Wi-Fi when they travel. Then, you know, we also, we also keep having a lot of rounds of consumer immersion where we talk to consumers. So I, I remember this consumer immersion where I was supposed to talk to this consumer and um, I asked him, you know, you're traveling to UK pretty much every month in a year and you never buy our packs. So why is it the case? You know, where are you, you know, getting all your needs fulfilled here in terms of travel needs? So he was like, excuse me, uh, 
I don't travel to UK every month. So I was like, but we see that you are in UK every month. So he was like, yes, we, I am in UK every month, but I don't travel every month because I've been staying in UK for last 12 months. Now, the reason why we thought this consumer travels to UK every month is because this consumer switches on his phone once every month. He connects to UK network and we see, oh, this guy is in UK now. We don't know that this guy was always in UK. He was just putting his phone on to check OTPs. Right? Now, so this is where data can mislead you. Right? The reality is something else. And when we spoke to many such consumers, we realized the real requirement they had was not that of a lot of data heavy pack for travelers. The real need was a pack which can really help give them a lot of, you know, cheap calling to India so that they can keep in touch with family back at home. It was not really so much about traveling, exploring, you know, so the whole context changed. Right, so this is how human interaction and intuition layer gets added on top of data and it becomes very powerful because we created like, you know, uh, a 200 odd crores worth of business just out of this insight wow. uh, in, in a year's time. Right, so this is, this is, this is an example which I thought Absolutely. I should share. Uh, Ishwindar, over to you, you know, do you have any real time experiences to share like Joydeep has uh, in your industry? Uh, Again, I'll go back to my old job. I'll follow exactly what Joydeep started. Uh, I guess it's a very interesting project uh, which we had started at a certain point of time and we said, uh, and this tells you how, okay, so you have different bosses, you have different styles of working and there was a point in time when one of my bosses was very clear, let's focus hardcore on data and we'll go with what data says. It's absolutely fine, let's do it. And we got into the development and a creation of a brand. And every time we would get a consumer research, you would say, you know what, I get what the consumer is saying, but are we really pushing the envelope enough? And as we finished the process, and we created the brand we created, we drew it and we, this is concept as in, we created the brand and we realized, if you put this next to the market leader, it was absolutely the same. So the consumer was very, very comfortable with the brand, which was the market leader. And by telling you, oh, I want it like this, I want it like this, he was in fact replaying his experiences, his design love, and his alignments of the market leader. Now that's the danger of just following data. Now you should understand what is important for the consumer and then get up and say, how do I really push the envelope and over deliver? So again, another conversation we have within the marketing field is, if people wanted a better phone, then Nokia should have never gone out of, you know, where it is. It was the largest brand, solid phones. You could throw a Nokia on somebody's head and, you know, <laughs> things would be very different. But the point is, Steel, you know, made phones, very good phones, great keypad. And every time you went for consumer research, the people said, oh, fantastic. I want it better. I want it smoother. I want it. But true disruption happens when you just don't look at data. You understand what is the unstated consumer need. And on top of that, give them a breakthrough disruptive product. So... Not just one, I've given two examples, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I think that is absolutely uh, interesting and insightful. Uh, Isha, you know, you end up working with a lot of brands and I'm sure, you know, this kind of comes to your foray all the time, yeah. right? So what would you say when it, when, what would you like tell your brands, you know, when it comes to like sort of having a balance between human intuition and the data that yeah. they would like to collect? Yeah, I think I, I would speak with the bad guy, the consumer research uh, a reference that has been given multiple times uh, from the panel. Uh, I think uh, one, uh, there's this beautiful word called lagun. It's from the Swedish language. And it actually means uh, not too much, not too more. Not too much, not too less. It's like just adequate. And I think the balance that we're talking about, specifically with data, comes in when you don't go for more. Specifically when you go for the right sources. So it's not just the number of channels where you're collecting the data from, it's how you are collecting it, why you're collecting it. 
Like if you don't want to go on the digital bandwagon of online panels, don't collect online data. Do offline. If purpose is remotely not even close to the mission statement for the brand, don't try and fit in purpose in it. So it's a lot to do with doing more with less. And uh, when we are working with a lot of uh, leads when it comes to uh, building communication, which is more purpose-led, we have detailed conversations with how the internal stakeholders align on that purpose. Because often we are looking for answers where we really get confused with the output from multiple sources of data, which generally doesn't lead to anything. Uh, the second piece that I would advise is that for a lot of brands today, looking at communities rather than bigger target groups is very important. Which is, uh, for example, uh, if I talk about, if I take Joy Lady or example, uh, looking at a much larger demographic versus a small community of gamers, the latter is obviously better because you'll get more insights uh, on trends as compared to a very big uh, piece or a universe of uh, sample set that you're going to go a big quantitative survey in as. Uh, a very good example, and of course, there are a lot of bad examples to state as well where purpose has gone wrong or personalization has really stretched too far. But a good one is, uh, I'm sure the visual designers or graphic designers and a lot, lot of people who love marketing have heard of Pantone, the color grading system, which has been uh, running forever and, uh, and, and makes for very good Instagram content these days. Uh, one would imagine how do, how do they bring in purpose? Now, it's just a color grading system, but they have something called as color of the year. And that color of the year is related to generally either sustainability or something very relevant in the ecosystem. Now, one would feel that this is a thought very fast-stretched, but it works. So often it's also about the third eye of the consumer, like Ishwinder stated. One is the data which is on the surface. Second is what you really get out of it. How can you be creative with it? And often that's the answer lies in common sense in just the gut. Uh, but data, of course, you need to support it, validate it. But starting right and starting less is something that I would say is what we recommend uh, to a lot of our client partners. Thank you. Uh, you know, Dipinder, in your case, you know, consumers are essentially patients, right? So today when you talk about human intuition, I think uh, that aspect you really need to bring about when it comes to consumers who are patients, right? So what would you say, how do you strike a balance between human intuition and the data insights that you receive? Uh, see, the uh, problem in our case is that when it's a patient, uh, your data will not tell you what is the person going through at that time. You know, it's super critical to talk to patients all the time. So we have an internal policy that, you know, the marketing team has to keep talking to patients, keep listening to what the patients are talking about. Because uh, your data will always tell you that, you know, uh, this is working, this is not. But the reason behind something working and something not working cannot be disclosed by data, right? You have to go and have that human interaction. We have believed it to be a part of our roots that, you know, when we, uh, the first page that we built, we didn't say that, let's just build a page. We said, okay, uh, there are these many patients we have come in contact with. Let's ask them, what were they looking for? Why did they reach out to us? And what would make them take a next step in the journey? So that's what we always do. And, uh, and just to give you another example, we did something with Facebook right now. We've, uh, we ran certain ads which take people from Facebook to WhatsApp. Now, our data was telling that, you know, all these people were not interesting in filling up the long form that we were having filled up in an interactive way, that there were around seven questions and people were stopping at fourth question. And uh, we said something is wrong. It, it cannot be that no one is interested and they're just coming answering four questions and not answering the rest of three questions. So we said, let's just try calling these guys up. So data was telling that these guys are not interested. So we called them up and uh, turned out that people said that I gave you my name. I gave you my phone number. I told you what disease I'm suffering from. I told you which city I'm from. What else do you want? There were three extra questions which you just put in. And if we just went with the data, we would thought these guys are not interested. And certainly these guys were the ones who were most interested in reaching out. They said, we've given you the information. Just reach out to us. So your int intuition and that human touch element is super critical. And data is just a validation that, you know, that uh, what you thought and what you have talked about and what you were trying to create, is that right or wrong? 
But, uh, you know, I just had a question here. When you're solving for scale, right, uh, at that point, it's not necessary. All the interactions that you have with your consumers could be on a human level, right? So then in that case, how do you solve for that scale problem? See, uh, even when you are at the scale, you're, uh, it is just that one person, even at scale, it will work. Reason is that, you know, you're not talking about each and every problems are similar. You have to solve for a bigger uh, chunk of the population and it automatically works. So uh, let's, for example, take a problem of cataract, right? Why does a person get a surgery done? Right? Why would someone reach out? So we did a, uh, we did in-depth interviews with uh, patients. And what we found out was it is not that uh, uh, is that suddenly they decided that, you know, I want to get a surgery done. They said, I was watching TV and I couldn't watch it anymore. It was becoming too blurry for me. So at scale, this has helped me in defining my communication. I know what I need to communicate to you, right? If I go on and say, get a cataract surgery done at scale, won't work. I have to go and touch those touch points and those can only come from these human interactions. And they tell you that, you know, how you're going to scale. So, uh, I believe that, you know, it's the right thing when you're talking to your patients, they tell you that, you know, what is it that is making you, you come to know what is making them click and what is making them tip. Right. Uh, Isha, I had a question for you, you know, and this is a billion dollar question. Uh, oh you know, God. what do you think are the best practices to use data in a very ethical and transparent manner, you know? And I'm sure you've seen this in your experience with working with different brands across, uh, you know, different industries. So what would you say are the best practices in this case? I, I think this, of course, is a work in progress. But I think it involves a lot of individual responsibilities across stakeholders. Uh, from At least from a data provider lens, I would say that it is absolutely important to check source of data. Like when I say source, like check where is the patterns from? Where is the respondent from? Are they fake respondents? Uh, also, authenticity and uh, just the privacy is like very important here. Uh, we have had situations where these things really go for a toss. But when you really go deeper into understanding sources, I think that's where it's curved uh, to the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joydeep, any thoughts on this, uh, you know, using data in a very uh, ethical and transparent manner? How do you ensure and what are the best practices to do that? See, as long as... Uh, Data is being used in a form where you're not using any personally identifiable information. Plus, you are using data to make the consumer's experience richer, right? Because see, the consumer is out there looking for a service, looking for something that you can fulfill, right? If you are able to use data to identify when is the right time and what is it that they're looking for, and you're able to provide it to them, it's a service you're doing to the consumers. I think the boundary lies where, you know, you start over communicating um, basis things which are not coming out from a consumer initiated activity, right? So for example, I know some set of consumers are, uh, you know, so, so for example, when you try to uh, push a product very hard and, and you're using, because, because you know consumers, uh, how you can reach them, right? And you over push, you basically, you know, um, weaken the linkage that the consumers have with you as a brand, right? So it's it's actually an onus on the marketing team, on the on the organization of how you communicate to consumers, how frequently do you communicate to them, when do you communicate, and how contextually are you reaching out to them? So this, if done right, really helps in building a, a, a trusted relationship between the organization and the consumers and, and really helps brand scale from there. So that's very crucial. Um, Madhur, any thoughts uh, from you on yeah. this? So I had two thoughts. One, you have mentioned uh, the right time and the right message. So I think one uh, uh, detail out which I felt that can be uh, good for this is uh, take your data, tell you where is that customer stand in your brand journey as of now. And uh, with the right time, give him a right messaging with the right intent where you want that consumer to go now next. And understand whether he has taken a lot of time 
and your algorithms tell you that either you have figured out by the by the knowledge of data and statistics statistic that he's not very much interested in this messaging or the product you're showing him or the campaign you're showing him either you go and give him something new something fresh or stop and wait for a certain duration where he definitely starts searching for you again and then the next messaging come out don't overlap and spend your money by again going to the first level of awareness because he's already aware so evaluate and understand the data on the depth and keep this army of your data ready for you whenever you have something big coming when you really think this is the right audience we have recently done that we have a lot of youngsters coming and uh, searching for a lot of fast fashion product and we were aware that we're going to come up with the very latest range which called hip hop it's a it's a it's a range which talks about again your young young audience it's a it's an era of sneakers long t-shirts and everything and we thought it's the right time to come with it we got a right face for it and then we used that data that these are the people who have always come but we eventually showed them something which is not really fun for for them very uh, ordinary transparent frames or glasses so when hip hop came to the picture we used that data which is dormant data for us and it converted well and we saw that the youngsters are being going to stores trying different layers they're buying three or four in one go and more strategies are coming on that way itself thank you uh, you know we've spoken a lot about personalization and segmentation cohortation right uh, so of course personalization is very very important in fact i would say it is the need of the hour i mean it's something that you would have done yesterday uh, but how do you create an experience that hyper personalizes this experience for your consumer you know i just like some two lines from each one of you that we just great to know oh uh, maybe mother if i can start with you personalization is uh, is as important as the first day of your of your business starts actually because you know you do all your entire consumer study i'm sure everyone does it that what what product i'm making is what is my target audience and there are two different audiences that i'm saying there's a buying audience and there's a target audience so for that element creating that personalization and keep improvising it with the with your with your journey with your knowledge keep getting more categories to your brand is something which i feel is a very important task uh don't just get stuck to something uh when you you talk about scaling also scaling is only uh, been possible if you cre- keep creating different categories under your business itself right. so uh, uh there are there are 40 kind of different shapes in in uh, eyewear itself what we know is i'm assuming the most famous is our wafer and aviators why don't we and there is no community and there is no information has been created at that level that you can you just see couple of celeb wearing it you might can get inspired about it and you want that shape but you don't know the logic about it you don't know the the aviator has a story that it was created for air force pilots because when they fly they basically have the pressure of air coming so that's why the aviator shape come out there's a story behind everything like that so that's how the and you when you start getting to know that yes this is a life i'm living and that personalization brand has done which is a right product for me right product mix right audience mix it goes well what about you joy deep any thoughts on this uh i'll just quickly summarize by saying that you know the primary objective of of marketing right is to influence consumers behavior is to change consumers behavior right from something that's there today to something that the organization would want to do this the starting point is to catch consumers attention and today all of us are inundated by so many communications from all the sides right we, we are just being bombarded you you can't go through you know 2 to 3 minutes of time without being bombarded with something you look at your phones it would be full of messages uh, which are about this right hence even to get to a point where you can capture somebody's attention even for however small duration it is you have to start with personalization if it's not personalized you stand no chance to capture any attention whatsoever forget about changing behaviors right, right? so that's that's how critical it is and i th- i think there's no way you know um, without it absolutely oh uh, esha just wanted to uh, you know get some thoughts from you on this as well So I would say that for hyper personalization or any kind of segmentation, because cohorts again has been like a buzzword uh, since like years. 
uh, we of course had personalization and hyper and now micro communities and so on and on. But three things that never change in segmentation that everyone can sort of uh, keep in check is time, place and money matrix, which is how long these segments or hyper personalized cohorts are going to sustain because they fast change today. If there was a segmentation exercise done for a lot of categories earlier, which lasted, those segments lasted for a few years. Now it's changing. Quarterly, we get requests for tracking segments, right? That's time. Second is where are you getting these segments from? And last is what is the value these segments which are giving to you? If you have these three in check, I think then hyper-personalization is sorted. Yeah. Um, Ishwander, if you can give us your thoughts on this. Yeah, I just want to say from a marketer's perspective to look a little differently, okay? And uh, especially when you're handling a portfolio brand, you have to look at, at what stage is your brand at? Okay. If you are a large dominant player, you've got to unite people behind your cause. Great brands, large brands unite people behind them. So therefore you take, you, you shouldn't worry about hyper-personalization, but you should find that one thread which unites a larger nation and get behind your brand. However, if you're a challenger or if you're a new age brand, okay, and you're, or you're trying to disrupt a category, then you've got to go hyper-personalization. You've got to break and create your unique space. If you, you cannot be brand number 70 doing the same thing and expecting to win. You can't. You have to disrupt the category and get up and say, I'm the first person who looks at the category this way and you will succeed. So data can be cut in whatever form you want. It really depends upon what your ambition is. But the point is, either you unite yourself or you micro-segment the market. That's what. That's how you've got to look at it. Um, Dependa? Completely agreed with what just Ishwinder sir said. Like, uh, being the latter, where I have to micro-segment my target audience to an extent where I have to give them an experience which is different from a hospital. When a person walks into a hospital, he's a patient for them. When a person walks into pristine care, be it the website, be it on one of my caller numbers, it is hyper-personalization starts at that very second. We have micro-segmented you to an extent. We know what you are, what you're looking from, where are you from. And we have to give you that experience for you to choose us over the other hospitals. Otherwise, there's so many hospitals out there that you would choose. The only reason I can pull you towards me is because of the service that I'm going to provide. I am going to personalize your journey. I am going to look after what you are looking for. And that is super critical for a new age player like us. That you know, you have to change it to an extent that you know, you have to make eyes turn that you know, this guy cares about getting me healed. Not just that I am a patient who's come in. So that's where the whole journey changes. Thank you. Uh, I think we've had some really insightful points from the panel here today. Uh, I'd like to actually open up the room, you know, if anybody has questions for our panelists here today. It would be lovely to hear from the audience. The gentleman in the back, please. Sorry, we'll just pass on the mic to you, if you can just give us a second. Mano Ricard, how do you connect with the consumer? Because you are very far distant from the consumer. It's your dealer, distributor who's handling the entire Yes, yeah, so uh, look, the point remains that if we've got to understand who are... Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So I guess this is about collecting data from our consumers. Okay, so we do have very strong and very frequent interactions with our consumer base through consumer researches and through our in-market interactions with them. So uh, as we said, there's a magic in of human connections. And therefore, when we go and we meet our consumers, we do understand about their needs and what are they really looking for. So that's how we really do it. So you do uh, on a digital platform or you physically... No, no, no. We've, we've got physical interactions. We've got consumer researchers. There's a complete toolkit which okay. exists within the system. Thanks. I've been in Lika. That's why I'm asking. All right. Oh, any more questions from the audiences?
Okay, if there are no further questions, I'd just like to wrap up this uh, session. Thank you so much, everybody. I think it's been, I know it's been after lunch, but I think we've taken some valuable nuggets from this today. And uh, thank you so much again. Thank you.